Dzień dobry, witam Państwa bardzo serdecznie. Kontynuujemy konferencję Konflikt, stabilizacja, asymilacja, konsekwencje migracji w życiu mieszkańców Dolnego Śląska po 1945 roku. Ujęcie komparatystyczne. E, obecna teraz Let's continue our conference and this session is opening a part dedicated to national minorities living or or permanently or at least temporarily active in the western and northern uh, territories, so in Low Silesia or in Pomerania. And so I am very glad that you're here, our audience, the people following us online. And the first to speak will be Mr. Iji Friedl from the Institute of History of the Czech Academy of Sciences. The floor is yours. Uh, he, he will present a paper entitled Jewish Refugees from Poland from the Czechoslovakian point of view, 1945-1948. A very interesting topic. So far, well, it hasn't been largely covered in Polish historiography. And these aspects of migration and of Jewish refugees from Poland after 1945 that was recorded by the authorities of uh, neighboring states and uh, we are talking about Czechoslovakia in particular um, in this paper but the problem is generally pure, uh, generally more extensive and um, you know they went through Austria and uh, through other European countries and they ended up in Israel usually so uh, um, so as not to elaborate I would like to um, give the floor to Mr. Friedel. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the invitation to uh, today's conference. And I have to admit that I feel slightly uneasy because after a two-year break, I somehow um, lost the habit of um, participating in authent my paper in Polish. However, sorry in advance for any mistakes I might be making in Polish because Polish is not my native language. However. However, hopefully these um, errors will not be um, an obstacle and will not hinder mutual understanding. I believe that it doesn't make any sense uh, it doesn't make much sense um, actually uh, to remind you about the situation in, in, in Europe after World War II because uh, uh, well it's clear that migrations, large-scale migrations were taking place but one particular refugee flux appeared in, in Europe at that time and they were heading for Palestine mainly where the um, State of Israel was to be established shortly and these included um, many Jews from Poland helped by the secret organization Bricha. This is not a topic that, um, that was ignored by historians because many um, memories were being published and reports, and so one can um, follow the most important um, history of the of the movement. However, the road to Palestine was long and winding, and led through uh, several other states. And an interesting aspect is the um, attitude of the transit states to this movement. Czechoslovakia was one of them, and uh, Heim Dekel, one of the uh, Bricha. Um, Activists actually called it one of the um, hubs for for Jewish refugees in Europe, the main transit countries. And uh, actually, uh, interestingly, uh, nearly all studies on the Bricha and on uh, Jewish refugees emphasize the significance of Czechoslovakia for this migration flux. And um, obviously, this research would um, would uh, require some um, some uh, extensive investigations in inquiring not only of Czech archives or Slovak archives, but also in Israel. But here, um, only Czech sources are um, presented in terms of the most important aspects of the attitude of Czechoslovakia to Jewish refugees from Poland. Uh, my uh, book, Domu as a Svobodo, uh, published last year, covers this topic more extensively. You can see this here. And the movement of um, Jewish refugees out of Poland um, uh, is covered in several chapters. Uh, this is um, 
generally about migrations after the Second World War from Poland. But actually, this was some. This had not been covered uh, earlier. Nearly one million Polish citizens um, passed through Czechoslovakia, uh, and not only repatriates or, or, or emigrants uh, covered earlier during this conference, but also refugees. Refugees who fled, um, for instance, things of Mikołajczyk's um, collaborators would uh, flee or couriers. Um, Connecting the um, underground uh, anti-communist, uh, sorry, the underground communist um, un uh, movement with uh, their, their counterparts in Europe. Uh, there was also a, um, a, a an armed forces brigade stationed in in, um, in Czechia, and so on and so forth. So the um, uh, rocks of Jewish refugees from Poland. This is covered in several chapters of this book, and this book, uh, the translation of this book, has started into Polish recently, so hopefully after some time you'll be able to actually read the um, Polish version. And uh, in my article, which I will send to the organizers after the conference, many aspects will be described in more detail. And this paper will be in the English language, because I do realize that the Czech language, um, its reach is not that vast, and I I'm sure that although obviously uh, I have not exhausted the topic by any means, I believe that I have been able to discover quite interesting things that are worth looking at, not only in Europe, but um, also this would be interesting for historians from Anglo-Saxon um, countries. And so the question of the attitude of Czechoslovakia to Jewish refugees is important also. And that this is often presented as um, univocally positive, especially the opening of the borders for refugees is emphasized in the summer of 1946. However, the authors usually uh, use standard documents, and so far there has been no detailed analysis based on a vast uh, query in, in Czech archives. So, what was the attitude of uh, state officers of Czechoslovakia in light of the files? Um, documents and how was aid organized by, for, for those who would flee and which difficulties were encountered? Well, the, the issue of Jewish refugees from Poland was noticed in Czechoslovakia straight after military operations ended in May 1945 and reports would um, come into the offices during the summer months about attempts to cross the border by individuals or smaller groups who'd use forged documents or pretend to be repatriates, mostly uh, Greek Jews. And uh, from the very first days of peace, there was the um, Bricha organization operating in Czechoslovakia, who, and they would actually rebuild several routes uh, through which uh, the um, refugees would be smuggled through Czechoslovakia to Western occupation zones in Germany and Austria, and then further on to Palestine. I will show you on the map the most important routes. And one goes through Nachod and Brumov and um, and to Prague and um, and then to the occupation zone in Germany. Another one to um, Bratislava and then to Vienna. And there were also um, other routes that went through the Zolgieland and through um, through Czechoslovakia and smuggling routes. However, through East Czechoslovakia were rarely used due to the security, the safety on the. Um, Czech uh, Polish border in the southeastern part of Poland. And uh, so the next picture shows us an example of, um, of a forged pass which was used by some um, of the people who were fleeing. And this was um, actually um, produced by some uh, workshop in um, Krakow. I found it in the State Archive in Opava. And um, according to Czech documents, in the um, summer of 1945, the Czech security services were well informed about the illegal migration of Jews from Poland. And the reports coming from police stations pointed to the growing number of refugees. And um, whenever those apprehended failed to produce documents uh, authorizing them to enter Czechoslovakia, they would be returned to Poland, and that was often accompanied by emotional scenes. The Jews begged to be shot instead of being sent back to Poland. Although the um, Ministry of Interior of Czechoslovakia issued an order according to which all Jewish refugees from Poland without 
um, valid documents uh, should be handed over to the Polish authorities. The sources show that sometimes this was not the case, and sometimes the Polish authorities refused to receive um, the, the refugees to welcome them. And a case was documented when the Polish border guards uh, refused a group of Jews to um, allow entry to, to Czechoslovakia and forced them to cross the border back again. Um, but the um, order of the Ministry of Interior was upheld, however, and reaffirmed, and all Polish citizens without valid documents caught during an attempt to cross the border illegally or already in the territory of Czechoslovakia were to be handed over to Poland. And at this point, it needs to be added as I pointed out at the start, that Czechoslovakia represented a transit area not only for Jews but also for Poles uh, fleeing to the West for political or economic reasons. And uh, there were several courier routes crossing the Czech land and to Slovakia the Ukrainian insurgent army troops would uh, also penetrate. So nearly ev any refugee from Poland would be treated with suspicion. And in the first half of 1946, uh, the influx of Jews from Poland intensified. And according to materials studied, it seems that although the Ministry of Interior's instruction ordering that all illegal refugees be returned to Poland, uh, it seemed to be um, still in force, exceptions would appear increasingly often. And um, we encounter most cases in, near the town of Nachod in eastern Czechia, um, near the border with Poland. And uh, faced with the growing number of Jewish refugees from uh, Poland and the pressures of the Ministry of Interior and the, um, also Foreign Office of Czechoslovakia, the Ministry of Interior eventually uh, issued in April, on the 18th of April 1946, new, a new instruction. And so instead of returning Jews to, to Poland, this order that they be allowed to transit through Czechoslovakia. However, the um, um, uh, main objective of the Czechoslovakian offices was um, actually preventing the refugees from settling uh, in the territory of Czechoslovakia in any way. So um, efforts were made to make them leave as soon as possible to the Western occupation zones in Germany and Austria. However, the um, care of um, Jewish refugees was chaotic and there was a lot of confusion. The offices would collaborate rather poorly and they were inept in um, sharing information about the steps undertaken and there was no central management of the whole campaign and the ministries, especially the Ministry of Welfare and of the Interior, would shift responsibility between um, each other and um, when after the Kielce pogrom there was this wave of refugees, it became clear uh, and that's until, well that, that's after the 4th of July 1946 it became clear that the whole campaign should be coordinated more effectively and um, the government decided uh, in July 1946 that um, care of the Jewish refugees in Poland would be entrusted to the Ministry of Welfare and this failed repatriation as the um, uh, Czechoslovak files called the whole campaign was also supported by the Prague branch of the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee uh, which was referred to as Joint um, colloquially and, um, and commonly, um, that was actually invaluable, but the, the huge costs were borne to a large extent by the Czechoslovakian state. And um, here we have a picture of the joint employee in Prague, uh, Israel G. Jacobson, the head of joint in Prague, and he worked with them, especially in the summer of um, 1946, where the biggest wave of refugees came from Poland. And faced with the opening of the border, um, transitory camps were, were actually prepared for, for, for the Jews in Nahod and in Bromov. These camps were, um, were set up. Uh, not everybody needs to know where it is, but Nahod and Bromov are a county city in, um, in this part of uh, Czechoslovakia. Further assembly points or master points in Ostrava. Uh, here near the Zolje region and in Slovakia also some master points in Zilina and uh, here in uh, Morocco and, and in Košice. And about these master points in Slovakia we don't know a lot but uh, I do believe that there is a chance to obtain some documents um, about these assembly points in Slovakia and um, 
and uh, there's a welfare employee, uh, there's a file on a welfare employee in um, Bratislava, and this will be probably, uh, shortly this will be made available to um, to researchers. However, we don't have info on the master points in um, Slovakia. So the camps in Nahod and Bromov uh, received the largest waves, uh, even a couple thousand refugees per day uh, in August, and the Czech Czechoslovakian administration sought to look after the refugees, but not always did go as planned. And after a short stay, usually a couple of days in the um, transitory in, 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 in camp, transport was organized through Prague to the American zone in Germany or to the border crossing to Austria near Bratislava. And from there, the uh, transport would, would be sent to Vienna. And one of the basic conditions set by the Czechoslovakian government for consent to transit of refugees was the guarantee on the part of the occupation authorities that they would um, uh, accept the um, transports, the trains um, um, soon and, and rapidly. And these are pictures from the um, um, receiving of refugees um, back then. And so Czechoslovakia, basically these um, these refugees were not allowed to settle um, and they were supposed to leave uh, as soon as possible the, the Czechoslovak territory. I've heard that was a um, that was a difficult situation for the British um, because the influx of Jews into Palestine created even more problems in the already tense um, Arab um, Jewish uh, relations, and they uh, exerted pressure on the Czechoslovak government to to have the borders closed, and the increasing troubles with uh, providing food in the occupation zones eventually forced the Americans to to suspend the um, receiving of further transports. And that was a reaction to the fact that on the 21st of September 1946, Czechoslovakia closed the border for for uh, Jewish refugees in response to this. And the border was reopened around the 15th of October uh, when the Americans, after the Americans had started to accept the transport again. However, the influx of refugees was not as big at that time as during the summer weeks of 1946. However. Americans kept struggling with problems related to the poor uh, situation in terms of supplies in their occupation zones in Germany and Austria, because apart from Jewish refugees, they had to accept millions of Germans um, resettled, displaced from Central and Eastern Europe. And so a plan was drafted for the temporary settlement of Jewish refugees from Poland in Czechoslovakia if the Americans proved to be unable to accept refugees in their zones. However, this plan was not implemented. And the gradual decline in the number of refugees observed from September 1946 um, uh, was uh, disturbed by the short-term um, increase in February 1947, when on the 20th of February, for instance, uh, more than, well, nearly 400 Jews um, arrived at the um, camp in Nahod. And that was probably associated with the decision of the Polish side to close the border, on which actually happened on the 22nd of February. And in those circumstances, the Jews sought to um, move to Czechoslovakia uh, as long as the border was open, but then uh, only illegal crossing was uh, possible. So a schizophrenic situation arose. On the one hand, the Czechoslovak offices kept organizing transit of Jewish refugees to Austria, on the other hand, or, or Germany, on the other hand, illegal crossing of the border would be punished and the refugees would be returned to Poland. And the escapees usually headed for Nahod, where there was still a center for care of um, refugees. However, the security services um, actually refused to um, ignore, increasingly refused to ignore these migrations. And in September, even they organized um, they organized a campaign to capture these uh, Jews, uh, a, a, dr a dragnet to to actually to actually apprehend them. And um, there were very emotional scenes with protests and cursing and, and shouts. And the police action triggered protests on the part of employees of the Ministry of Welfare. So the Czechoslovak um, security service again, again, uh, would um, pretend to ignore that, um, ignore the illegal, illegal flux of uh, Jewish immigrants. And in um, 
Uh, however, the numbers of Jews who were fleeing kept declining. And in April 1948, the Czechoslovakian authorities decided to close the center in Nahod and to end the operation of looking after the um, Jewish refugees from Poland. And the Polish Czechoslovakian border was closed. And according to the Ministry of Welfare, Care was provided to around 116,000 uh, refugees, uh, Jewish refugees from Poland, from July 1946 to April 1948. And this number obviously takes into account only those people who had officially appeared in the transit camps. We don't know how many people, however, transited through um, Czechoslovakia without registration and before uh, July 1946. So another question related to that concerns the number of refugees before the Kielce pogrom. And the absence of data allows us to make estimates only. And one can assume that um, in the years 1945 to 1948, around 120 to 150,000 Jews from Poland would um, cross Czechoslovakia. And the organization of care of Jewish refugees from Poland represented a big challenge for the Czechoslovak authorities. And despite the huge effort made by many social workers who wanted to help those in need, the activity of state offices was characterized to a large extent by chaos and lack of coordination. Only after the Kielce pogrom, when Czechoslovakia had to face a huge wave of Jewish immigration from Poland, and the most severe humanitarian crisis since the end of the war, uh, was it possible, although not without problems, to establish some system of care of Jewish refugees from Poland? Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for the interesting um, presentation. And I believe that um, our audience um, uh, has come up with or will come up with questions questions for EG because the topic is not very well known. This is the point of view of the Czechoslovak government. Um, I, uh, as far as documents are concerned, uh, which um, our um, conference attendee from the Czech Republic used, these are mostly documents produced by central state administration authorities. However, there are many interesting aspects here. Um, you know, presenting the inside story of the migration of uh, Jewish refugees through Czechoslovakia, whether to Western Europe or to Palestine back uh, then. So let us uh, continue on this note and uh, continue to talk about Jewish population. And um, so Marek Szajda will um, give the next presentation from the Remembrance and Future Center, who will give us a um, presentation on a uh, well, slightly um, later period. Namely, this is late 50s um, until early 70s. So migration to destabilization, Jewish life in Lower Silesia and West Pomerania in 1957, 1967. Tak, dziękuję bardzo. I don't thank you very much. As you can see, my role here is a, a twofold one. I'm a host and a speaker here. And it glanced me in a lot that I can tell you a bit about my own research with respect to the subject that I'm about to address. But let me start with something atypical. Yes, from poetry. This year is known as Tadeusz Rewidus year. Uh, we are also a place where some Let's see, and marks actually of him are stalled. So let's make this fragment of his, the small stabilization, tiny stabilization from his poem, one that has actually been enumerated. A tiny stabilization may just be a dream, but truly, deeply, I believe that everything will settle down and one can breathe. However, something bothers me from being wakened to falling down. Our stabilization may just be a dream. So that's the starting point, whether this little stabilization is or was a dream. Can we actually speak of little stabilization with regard to the Jewish community in Poland? Well, obviously, the very same statement uh, was uh, referred to in different 
historians through certain studies many time just to mention those um, researchers Martin Zaremba, Przostek, Paweł Rutkowski from Warsaw were set against different context they were actually wondering about stabilization versus destabilization whether in the intellectual elites or in other circles or generally with regard to the Polish society so that would set one perspective the other would be that of the researchers addressing the Jewish society Jewish those Polish researchers that uh, wrote uh, the most, however, they did not directly refer to this a little stabilization uh, notion. They rather addressed the relationships between Jews and Poles. And I think the most topical of the study, or the results thereof, is that of Professor Audrey Kichelewski, working in France in her latest book. A lot's been said about that. And again, not with, regard to, not with regard to the notion of the stabilization, which I'm about to address. That's the baseline. Whether from the perspective of the Jewish people uh, post-1945, or to more precisely post-1957 up to 1967, can we actually talk about a little stabilization, stabilization at all, or rather destabilization? Using the examples from <coughs> West Pomerania and uh, Lesser and um, Lower Silesia, the regained lands, the regained territories where the Jewish settlements are actually in numbers, and actually these facts had a significant impact on their lives. So, in order to uh, in order to actually determine whether there was any stabilization or destabilization, let's move back to the year 1956. So. The watershed year with regard to the milestone research of uh, Pavel Machcevich, Professor Machcevich, uh, the Polish year 1956, that was the title of his book, with one section devoted to anti Semitism, but also to a Jewish people and the Jewish community here. So the Jewish year 1956, even though this is a direct reference to this book, is to a certain extent a certain experiment. Because if you think of what happened then, can we look at it from the Jewish perspective? Both the October 1956 and the anti-Semitism that they suffered from to different degrees, in different months, in different seasons, either through political uh, political events or certain assemblies and meetings that were held all through some specific experiences. Uh, these were observed for children. These were the uh, experiences of um, schools for the working class. These were the experiences of workplaces. Still, all of them clearly highlighted that the anti-Semitism of these times was something that even for such organizations as the, um, the, the Polish Association of Jews was something that they couldn't handle, just could not. And something that is quite problematic if we refer to this October thaw and the consequences of October. The experience of hostility, that's one thing. But there is something else that starts it, a perspective that is broader than just Gomukas uh, Alia. Uh, with regard to the de-settlement um, of the 1960s. Yes, we know that obviously 50,000 Jews displaced. At that time, significant share of the Jewish community left Poland. However, this group uh, had subgroups. The Gomukas Aliyah obviously had different shades, such as the one referred to as refugees um, living, those that actually felt threatened or their families being threatened, but also people who, to a certain extent, experienced that that was a sort of an opportunity to leave Poland as they were allowed to by the Polish state, because at that period, actually, they were allowed to leave Poland. But also not only Jews, also Germans and uh, people of German ethnicity were allowed to leave. I'm not going to explore all that. Anyways, 
people threatened or subject to anti-Semitism or uh, persecuted in that times, those willing to leave to Israel, for instance, immigrants, but to a certain extent also those that, for instance, were party activists or officers of the security service. So the array of different representatives of the Jewish community decided to leave um, communist Poland at that time is rather significant. What was dominant next to this threat was also this disenchantment of Poland and this feeling of disappointment with Poland. Now, I uh, of Gomułka as the immigration, that would be one group. The other group, however, is the second repatriation uh, wave of people that is coming to Poland, 18,000 Jews, including a fair share of those that would become the part of the end of the 1950s uh, displacements. However, some thousands of those would stay in Poland and they would start something completely new. And I'm not sure whether they could be referred to in the context of the little stabilization that I started my presentation from. But I'm talking about roughly 30,000 Jews who came in the 1960s in Poland to find the place here anew. So if that was a new beginning for them, it turned out that not only for them, for the entire Polish society that was a new beginning. Because thanks to this heritage of the Thor, maybe a too far-fetched notion. However, thanks to the uh, operations of the joint, who came back also uh, to Poland in 1958. I suppose that was one of the most important elements of this phenomenon that I'm referring to, the, the gradual introduction of stabilization to Poland. By the year 1950, I was an organization that, w that had been operating in Poland past 1950, it was all reorganized and certain sectors of the Jewish community's lives in Poland. Uh, however, this organization was mainly and primarily financing these operations, not only the Social and Cultural uh, Society of Jews, but also some other institutions, clearly supporting the, the Jewish life in Poland. And I believe that was the most crucial component that came to being at that time as a consequence of more extensive, broader phenomena, including the Thor and, uh, and October 1958. So what I would like to propose in this particular respect, stabilization versus destabilization, is a perspective of, th or actually a look from three levels and two perspectives. Now I'm not going to overanalyze this, I'm not going to break them down into too many pieces, but I would just like to highlight certain processes that were observed. Both in the breakdown into levels and the perspectives and the certain juxtaposition of certain groups. So first, stabilization versus destabilization and those three perspectives. One, that will be the broadest one, the macro perspective, meso perspective, and micro perspective. So what happened throughout this decade of, well, apparent stabilization? The fact that had the biggest stabilizing uh, effect was politics and finance, very closely linked factors. The politics of, of the communist um, uh, administration in Poland, but the financing of the Jewish activity in Poland. So on the one hand, we are talking about the Thor, inviting people back and allowing them to operate freely. On the other hand, from the political perspective, one should notice that indeed, as the situation developed, as the years passed, as time passed from the Polish October and the Thor related changes and the increasing nationalism of the Communist Party, from the macro perspective, the politics had a significant impact on uh, the activity of uh, TSKZ and the joint. So insofar as in uh, 1950s, the turn of 1950s, the finance, uh, the funds were actually obviously very important because they were supposed to provide some material support to the Jewish community. It was not the, the core of the decisions made by the state uh, administration, however, 
there was a certain specific contribution in dollars, in foreign currency, obviously, that can also be utilized or played, let's say, in a colloquially speaking game played between um, the Ministry of the Interior uh, and uh, the representatives, the representatives of the Jewish community. But the importance thereof actually dwindled nearly completely in uh, mid-1960s, in 1965, in 1966. The very fact that Joint offered a certain specific uh, contribution was not of interest to the communist uh, authority. So, so the mezzo level, the L the, the admission for the broader operations of Jewish uh, organizations, including certain financial background, that translates into certain specific frameworks, operating frameworks being established, uh, organization of, of summer camps and, and, and support for, for schools, as well as the extensive uh, operations uh, um, uh, of, uh, of the Social and Cultural Jewish Association in Poland. But from the perspective of the previous years and the period of Stalinism and how the life of Jews uh, was limited, was shrinking, the very fact that new institutions were uh, forming and the fact that they were covering certain specific groups of the Jewish community with their operations because the uh, Social and Cultural uh, Society of Jews helped the elderly, provided some welfare um, support, gave them the opportunity to um, to be uh, covered by some 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 uh, shelters for for uh, elderly people, as Piotr Pinchinski stressed in his study. That was an element that was something new. Probably also something interesting for the young people because they could, I don't know, go for a couple of weeks to Poronin, to Zakopane, or to spend their summer camp in, in the seaside. But a part of the micro level, as far as the, let's say, cooperatives being established, that was something completely different. You know well what followed uh, October 1915, the penultimate book by uh, Koshinsky. Uh, for the Jews released from cooperatives, they found their places in newly established cooperatives that were functioning thanks to the money from the joint. Also, the development of the uh, social and uh, the sociocultural uh, society of Jews was also of of, of uh, important not only for for Kshitime, our voice was a certain proof thereof, and the micro level, certain level of experience of this community being uh, taken care of, the feeling of belonging to the community as the, the uh, attendance of, of, of those camps, um, the summer camps and winter camps mentioned, being given the opportunity to develop through contacts, that also was very important. So these were those three levels. Now two perspectives of the narrative of stabilization. And again, activists versus society. What is important is that the materials left of the Sociocultural Society of Jews, stabilization must be perceived as something very important. Yes, obviously, may argue that I refer to Rzevich and his poetry and to certain historians that make use of it, but realistically, in the years 1958, 59, 60, actually the activists discussed whether the country was stable or not, whether the mass migration, whether uh, in the post-antisemitism um, times, did they actually face stabilization or not? These are the topics really discussed at meetings, assemblies of the uh, uh, the directorate of, uh, of the imagining boards of the Sociocultural Society of Jews. I'll just give you an example of Szczecin and Wrocław, obviously. The interesting thing was that the leaders of the Jewish community and how they understood the very notion of stabilization, hence the quotations on the slide, uh, which I'm not going to actually read out. But I'd like to draw attention to the very fact that stabilization was understood very specifically in terms of immigration. Uh, so migration movement, stabilization, non-movement. Without migration, we are talking about stabilization. Obviously, that's, well, overly simplistic approach, not clear. However, the second 
a factor for the thinking about stabilization was that, yes, our organization is active. So the very testimony for this stabilization would be subscribers to our periodicals, meetings of choirs, of artistic groups. The very fact that we operate would be the hallmark of stabilization in Poland. On the one hand, people not moving away Poland. On the other hand, us being able to perform standard operations. On the other hand, however, there was a different perspective as well. The very notion of stabilization was, wasn't was reiterated quite frequently. It doesn't appear too much in documents of the, uh, of the society. Yes, the people obviously were glad that they could uh, cooperate, uh, go for some summer camps, that they received funding of sorts and public aid and so on and so forth. But they did not perceive that as, by they, I mean the common people, they did not perceive that as the activists did. They didn't perceive it as being able to make use of what hadn't been there before. So that's as much as the stabilization is concerned. Now a couple of words about destabilization. Insofar as the activists were arguing whether the war stable, uh, situation was stable or not, so they came to some conclusion near the year 1960, they were not discussing the destabilization problem. However, it was the case in that period shortly after the year 1956-57. However, it wore different faces. The cooperatives established at that time, the communist authorities pressed those co cooperatives to operate in certain specific sectors, to do specific things, or the rationing of the funds coming from the joint and that was a means for them to precisely control the operations of the Sociocultural Society of Jews, what sort of cooperatives were being established. And they actually ordered that the revenue uh, obtained could only be spent, could only be allocated on certain specific tasks so that they could virtually not develop, they could not grow. In the 1960s, they were preparing for for the millennium of the Polish state, the 1000th anniversary, and Jews obviously also organized certain specific events. What was interesting in preparation for the 1966, in reply to uh, the official letter of the Jews in which they reported on and summarized their common life in Poland, described their every, everyday life, the state authorities replied uh, to individual activist of the central managing board in which they signaled quite clearly that they saw needs for their everyday life being limited or interfered with how much money or how much support from foreign institutions they received. Then there's this correspondence with the joint and some tiny hints here and there that the operations, their financing should be to a certain extent restricted. And the Six-Day War, which is not stressed as much as it should in a Polish historiography with regard to the Polish community, it changed the perspective of the life of Jews. And it was a shock, the very, let's say, trial shock before it happened in March 1966, shortly after the Six-Day War, some cleansing, let's say, in the military, but also in workplaces, and obviously propaganda clearly hitting those that um, supported the aggressive Zionist, Zionist in the East. The consequences of the Six-Day War uh, obviously was uh, what was decided in consequence of the, the Rav was to bid farewell to the joint for their uh, activity in Poland and uh, starting from 1966 it had a significant consequence on the life of Jews in smaller towns but I'm not going to go there because I'm running out of time dramatically to conclude the stabilization that's a passage from uh, Zaremba's text where the author argues that indeed there were certain elements against the entire Jewish community which implied that something was you know advocating stabilization other factors were supporting the theory of destabilization so one might claim that 
there was a little stabilization and a bit of the other as well. Now, my proposal, now my perspective would be the following. And again, with regard to Ruzevich's poem that I opened my presentation with, where he claimed that the stabilization may just be a dream. Now, what I think is, from the perspective of the Jewish community, the stabilization was rather seeming. Insofar as the community felt stable, the activists in certain times, especially throughout 1960s, clearly noticed the impact of state authorities and attempts to try to make uh, or, to, um, or to exploit the funds, for instance, or the impact on the funds, which was not clearly noticeable, but definitely was leading to what happened in 1968. And the creeping destabilization problem, so the stabilization that step by step would disturb the Jewish community in Poland. And last but not least, a tiny reflection that little stabilization or seeming stabilization is but an illusion for the very fact that the consequences thereof, namely what happened in 1967 and 8, for the Jewish community was a huge shock, not to mention the anti-Semitic uh, campaign of March 1968 and the consequences of the Six-Day War. Before that, elements that obviously completely uh, turned the Jewish uh, everyday life around. These are also arguments for the thesis that the stabilization of the Jewish community's life was just the seeming one, or it might have just been perceived as an illusion. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, very interesting, well, and multifaceted presentation. So we are closing the Jewish theme, the Polish Jews theme in this session, and we are opening another presentation by Barbara Grzybek from the State Archives in Wrocław, uh, Bolesławiec uh, branch, on the Roma Society in Lubań. This is a community which is part of um, of a larger community, but the Roma in Poland are um, actually very um, very diversified. We are talking actually about several communities here, and um, if we talk about the Polish People's Republic. Um, where it was an ethnic minority, it didn't have this political weight um, compared to the Jewish, Ukrainian, or German minorities. It had more of an aspect, you know, of a challenge for, for Polish authorities at the time in the kind of social context. But, um, well, the details will be given to you by, um, by Ms. Barbara Grzybek, who will, who will tell us more about it, um, about the Roma in Lubań. 1948-1955, on the basis of uh, the sources of the National Archive, State Archive in Wrocław, the po branch in Polish Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for giving me the possibility of um, presenting my paper before such an outstanding audience. And first of all, first of all, due to uh, well your output and the and the wonderful presentations. Uh, but Wukar Sotishik also gives me stage fright here because he's an absolute expert in terms of um, in terms of uh, these aspects related to Roma, and so he he actually covered a lot of that um, uh, also in the context of the um, political system transition. So Wukar, I uh, I do um, uh, ask you to show your understanding and uh, to be. Um, to be kind, but but um, uh, the Roma, uh, according to the Act on National and Social Minorities and on the Regional Language, are a are an ethnic minority in Poland, and there are specific conditions set forth which determine what kind of um, a group we can designate as an as an ethnic minority. We also talk about the. Karim, Lemko, Tata minorities in Poland, which are, I think, minorities. And the first mentions of, um, 
of this um, community because this group of um, the population is um, has been actually determined since identified since the 14th 15th century in the Krakow area uh, goes on until 1971 actually and um, I have to admit that um, that there is this name Gypsy in the sources and never does the name Roma actually appear and just imagine Marela Rodovic, the Polish singer, uh, talking about the uh, you know, the colorful wagons with the Roma. No, these are Gypsy wagons, right, in the old um, parlance, uh, so, so to speak. So uh, during the Congress in 1971 held near London, that was the first World Congress of the Roma and um, uh, there, it was determined that the word gypsy was um, actually um, pejorative, and uh, since that time, the name um, Roma uh, has actually been um, has been used. So that was during the World Romani Congress, and um, in Lubani, actually. Uh, uh, the archive, the state archive in Wrocław, uh, the um, Bolesowitz branch uh, had its um, office in Lubań um, in the past. And on a daily basis, I would meet with the Roma because they, um, the Roma, the gypsies, they basically became part of the um, uh, townscape, so to speak. And for a long time, a member of that community kept asking me about what, what the time was. I don't know what he was going on about, but, um, you know, uh, that uh, community had been there, well, since, you know, uh, ages and, um, and, and, and uh, according to the results of research by Wukash and myself, the Roma appeared in Luban. Uh, um, after the war, they were resettled there or arrived there in search of a better life. This mythical, legendary El Dorado, which um, actually the propaganda depicted Lower Silesia as, as, a, as a land of opportunity or, or of a, a whole array of opportunities. And the traditional um, occupations of the Roma, well, you all know because we've all uh, seen that, we've all met members of that community and, uh, you know, singing, dancing, you know, fortune telling, theft, and so on and so forth. The state archive the, the, in Wrocław, the Bolesowiec branch, uh, actually holds um, a group of fun um, related to, um, of, of sources related to, to that community. Because after the war, they arrived with different groups of population. And in um, registration books, there is no mention of nationality. And we, we can't really say um, how many of them actually came to um, Lubania. And according to the findings by Łukasz, a small group appeared. Um, a small group appeared with the resettled Lemko population as part of the Vistula um, action. But um, as you said in your research, well, it's hard to determine the the, uh, the, the accurate number. And um, apparently there were a lot. Well, there weren't a lot of them. But so, what is characteristic of this group of the population living in Luban? Well, it's the Bergitka Roma, uh, and um, basically. This uh, division, this breakdown, was introduced by Jerzy Fitzowski, a researcher of merit, uh, of, 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 uh, who deserves a lot of credit for the research. So he talked about the Polska Roma, the Polish Lowland uh, Roma, the Bergitka Roma, uh, also uh, also described as the um, Sanag Roma and Kelderasze and Rovasze. And then also there's a small group of Sinti, but this is mainly the area of um, of Germany. So my analysis of the sources, well, this presentation is a popular science presentation, actually, and it can be seen in its entirety on the website of the State Archive in Wrocław uh, in the Odcienia Regionalismu uh, tab. But the paper as such will analyze the individual sources in the context of the uh, state's policy, because state's policy with regard to national minorities with regard to the Roma minority, it starts back in 1949 uh, when 
by order of the 18th October, the Ministry of Public Administration, the first attempt was made to register Roma population as a separate ethnic group in the area of the whole of Poland. And this actually failed, this attempt, because the Roma approached this reluctantly. And in some powiats, in some countries of Lesser Asia, this campaign was not even carried out. Further campaigns of that sort, their aim was to to count the Roma, to record their numbers, and to force them to settle, uh, to adopt a different lifestyle. In the socialist state that was under construction, this narrative was adopted. It was determined that there was no place for nomads in, um, in Poland, and um, at all costs, they sought to force them to settle and to to live a different life. Well, um, maybe I look young, but I'm not that young, you see. And I remember the colorful, um, gaudy Roma wagons. But, but there is also a, another mistake made by the central authorities. And I I don't know if that was in, on, at the counter level, but, but um, they didn't distinguish between the different Roma groups. And, um, and uh, it turns out that um, the same decisions, the same orders cons actually concerned all Romani groups, but they they had no application with regard to the Roma living in Lubin because they uh, were from the Bergitka Roma group. And uh, I believe Fukash, since the 17th century, right in Subcarpathia, they, uh, they actually settled as early as in the 17th century there. So coming to Lubin, they were actually settled there. And that was the policy back then, and many towns are still struggling with it. So in the downtown, in the, in the, in the city center, and in Wuzicka Street, and there, the Roma still live today. And uh, well, we are the Gaji, that means the non-Roma people, the non-Gypsies. So this is referred to as the Gypsy Street. Um, well, I, I, I made no agreements with Mr. Marek Scheider, but, but my presentation also starts with poem. 1953 poem. This is a poem by Papusha, a poetess from the Polska Roma group. And this is translated by uh, a man, a researcher, uh, the author of many publications, Jerzy Ficowski, as I said, a man of many m merits for this community. and. Um, this is a brief presentation of where the Roma are from, where they settled, and so on and so forth. And uh, here's a reference to Papusha. There's a museum dedicated to this figure in Gorzów Wielkopolski. Papusha actually couldn't um, uh, couldn't uh, re rewrite. Uh, so um, actually, now uh, Roma children are forced to. Um, to, to go to school, and she was illiterate. So um, um, basically, this is difficult now. Now there's an assistant at the Voivodeship level, an assistant for education of Roma children. And they are supposed to um, actually coordinate and to explain, explain to people what the advantages of going to school are. Um, so there is an order issued at the level of the presidium um, about counting um, Roma people and forcing them to settle. And that was actually uh, related to the fact of them being illiterate to a large extent. And the, the Romani language, uh, which was also identified at the World Romani Congress, is a spoken language. It is handed down in tradition. And there are no. Um, there's a written text in the um, Romani language and um, descriptions of their customs, you know, Papusha's poems were translated by Jefitsovsky actually and, um, and then by other researchers. So this is the um, question uh, which I've already answered to some extent. Well, the Roma or gypsies? Well, the great researchers, Fitsovsky and Rus, uh, they, they didn't consider the word gypsy as a particularly negative um, term. They just said that it had always been around. But the gypsies themselves, actually, they, um, they, they approach it in very different ways, really. For instance, Kwiatkowski, 
the chairman of um, a Roma organization, he claims that if we keep saying gypsies, then they will just um, continue to be gypsies. Uh, but, um, you know, it's not only the ma matter of political correctness, but if any nation wants or believes that they should be described in this way, then I think that we should actually embrace this. And I suppose, yes, that, that we should do that. And here, the, the law I mentioned about the conditions to be met by a specific ethnic minority in order to be considered as a um, as an ethnic minority to meet these conditions and this is associated with the fact that there are certain privileges uh, attributed to that group and here we have selected literature selected references because there is a vast body of literature on this i've already mentioned the papers by wukash here but um, some outstanding researchers have written about this um, you know on a nationwide level the um, the themes of gypsy is it's a colorful, beautiful topic, but it's difficult to to investigate because gypsies are reluctant to talk to the gaji, you know. Uh, they don't believe us non-gypsies to be, um, uh, you know, as good as they are. So um, a gajo is not as good as a, as, as a gypsy. So the... Um, the Romani themes uh, had also appeared in Luban before by the with the help of the director of the Regional Museum in Luban. This is the first popular science session during which um, various researchers were brought together um, addressing these topics. And um, I had the pleasure of um, presenting a popular science paper on um, the sources about the Luban Roma. And I have to tell you that Many of them found out that they were Bergit Karoma at that time. They had no idea. And here we have, um, you know, the current deputy minister, Marjana Mahawek, uh, the, uh, the deputy mayor, who's uh, already passed away, the starost, and, and so on and so forth. The whole group was represented of authorities. And then the group of the Roma is, is that, and here is my presentation, and so on. And here we have some exactly pictures. But coming back to the sources, the first source is the resolution of the town national council, uh, which actually talks about. Well, we let's admit it, without any prejudice, you know. Well, what? What are our associations? Roma, you know, dirt, uh, you know, damaged uh, property, laziness, uh, you know, and um, and and so on. So um, basically, this particular resolution, in the context of the um, city's um, um, uh, national policy, this concerns this scruffiness and uh, the purported way of life of the Roma, the dirt, you know. The, that they keep, you know, cows and horses in the, the you know, city center, in the town center, and they generally damage the buildings they live in. And here there are some archival sources, and these are statistical sources. After 1952, however, using administrative methods, there were attempts to force Roma to, to, to be counted, and they, the authorities kept encouraging them to, uh, to settle. And uh, in Luban, that was really unjustified because that group actually had settled before. So, so basically, this was a um, um, ready-to-use form for this um, national group 9A. That was its code, prepared centrally by the ministry. And these um, the, the survey questionnaires uh, were handed to um, indigenous people and to people of German nationality. So to the locals and to people of German origin. And then um, we can learn a lot there. Because in the survey questionnaire, there were well, the town authorities and the county authorities had to had to answer and send it to the voivodeship office, and the voivodeship office then sent the collected information to Warsaw. And uh, this collected information can be found, which Wukasz has researched in in the state archive in Wrocław at the Institute of National Remembrance, and at the general national level in the. Um, in the in the respective archive and um, 
and new files and archive and um, I referred to sources from the archive in Bolesławie. It's There's not a lot of that, but very interesting um, info. And we can learn, for instance, that in the years 1952-1954, there were quarterly reports that the general population is 43 people, including 43 settled. So uh, and the number of nomads, none. The number of gypsies who got a job to people. Uh, art ensembles, uh, much better, you know, one. Uh, and um, and special meetings were dedicated and radio broadcasts were dedicated to this. And, and that's um, around one, two in these reports or none. Um, and so these surveys were composed of a statistical part uh, uh, and a descriptive part. And um, that was um, a kind of interpretation of orders of higher authorities. And uh, the questions were also about the degree of loyalty when uh, complying with the orders of the authorities. And um, and that was the that was how this compliance was defined as unsatisfactory. And the relations between the um, gypsy population and the local population as sufficient. And that was the um, evaluation. And all the reports mentioned the fact that the population, uh, that there were some gypsies in Lubani. So the uh, Romanian population were illiterate, they couldn't read or write, they had no education. Where did they find a job? Well, in the waste um, management company, and um, uh, but then they were actually all allowed to set up cooperatives. I don't know if you remember that, some of the younger people don't, but uh, a pan bought from a gypsy, well, that was something, uh, you see. And so um, these... Um, these um, actual uh, jobs, you know, these activities were good for them because they were experts in, the, in, the, in that craft and that made it possible for them to earn some money. And so still today, well, we, we can't say it's not there, you see. Um, people are reluctant to employ gypsies or Roma in, you know, some more responsible positions because, you know, when they find out or they say, or they claim that they will, you know, steal, or that their work will not be diligent enough. And um, that Roma assistant, actually a very nice lady, uh, and with higher education, mind you. So Katarzyna Antic, um Przybyła, she comes from a mixed family. So her father was a Pole, and her mother was a Romani. She married a Pole, so her child is, um, you know, a quarter. Uh, Roma blood, but what drew my attention when talking to the lady was that uh, for her it's extremely important that the child uh, go through the um, whole education process because she says that in her contact with the Roma population that's something absolutely amazing just how difficult it is um, to um, encourage, to persuade contemporary Roma people to um, to get some education. I don't know, maybe that's just characteristic of these ethnic ethnic groups that you live from one day to the next, you know. Um, you know, whatever, um, whatever works. And so, but now there's welfare developed uh, quite extensively and a lot of Roma use it. And this is the most valuable document, 1955 the only list of uh, Ro Roma people living in Luban. Names and surnames are given, uh, and the dates of birth, and the place of residence, which is extremely valuable. And I uh, handed this to Katarzyna so that she could hand it over to, uh, the, to, to, her, um, to, to her community. And uh, a part is, is, is actually covered here, and uh, we, because GDPR, you see, and we are not allowed to present certain data. However, these sources are available. And to, answering, uh, to conclude, answering the question whether integration or assimilation is the case, well, in my conversations with um, the representatives of uh, the Roma community, or Ms. Katarzyna Ontic przybyła, this process, well, it results that this process of assimilation is there, but integration, they are still living separate lives uh, uh, and cultivating their traditions. Uh, and the young generation, however, do not feel attached to the um, 
uh, Romani language uh, so much. So, so in the opinion of Katarzyna, this integration will be progressing. My personal impression is that perhaps there will be a, this division, but not a division resulting from ethnic or national differences, ethnic in this case, but from social differences. Um, it will result. So unless Roma children go to school, they won't get education and they won't find a decent job. And so they will, will stay in the margins of society. Uh, so I've been able to stick to time. Thank you. Bardzo dziękuję. Thank you very much for presenting this story of the Roma community in Lubań. And ladies and gentlemen, we have a bit of a delay, but um, I would like to actually have some questions asked of our speakers because the themes are extremely interesting. And uh, we have um, this topic of um, international topic of Polish Jews who migrated to Palestine or to Western countries in the years immediately following the Second World War. And we have the theme of Jews in Poland who who tried to take root um, um, and kind of stabilize the, the situation in the period under Gomułka in Poland. And finally, we have a more marginal community in the Polish society if we take into account ethnic and national minorities living in Poland at that time, and that's the Roma community. So a, a, a non-homogeneous um, community composed of four distinct groups at least, and a closed one, so I opened the floor for discussion. Agnieszka Klarman, IPEN. Agnieszka Klarman from the Brota branch of the Institute of National Members. I don't have questions, but rather suggestions or comments to the last presentation, namely the following. I'd like to say it out and loud, clearly. Uh, within me, I hold a huge resistance towards calling uh, the Roma people as gypsies. Well, regardless of what Marinera Rodowicz sings, uh, you know, it's the same as uh, the famous Polish poem about the Negro called Bambo. Well, we don't actually call a nigger or Negro with regard to persons of African origin. We stick to the political correctness. However, with regard to the Roma people, it is somehow easier for us not to be politically correct. On the other hand, what I notice is the narrative about the Roma Romani people in Lubań. As usually, it was done 100 years ago from the perspective of anthropologists, ethnologists going somewhere deep into the South American jungle, speaking about the autochtons or natives, aborigines, as people that are completely separate or different. I believe that such a narrative towards the Romani people is deeply hurtful, deeply spiteful, actually and duplicating certain specific templates of, of narrative or, or even saying that you know the roma people were suspected or famous of being dirty or of, uh, of theft and so on and so forth it's just saying that through the perspective of historical sources to which we actually have access therefore if, let's say, a security service sends a query, namely, do the Roma people steal? The obvious answer is, yes, they do. But no one was asking in all those queries what the Romani people were doing that was good for the local community. Nobody inquired about how many people were happy about, you know, getting those frying pans from the Roma people. No one asked those questions. So it was really difficult for me to to find any, let's say, thesis of your presentation, despite the very fact that the Romani people in Lubang in the years referred to 
was actually there. In other words, without any reflection and what, do you, what would you say that such a non-reflexive commenting upon historical sources, what does it tell us about the history of these people, a part of actually duplicating certain very specific you know, schematic ways of thinking? I don't think we should do that in the 21st century. Uh, I suggest that we should first ask questions to all the speakers, and then there will be a round of answers or comments, reflections, and again, I will also like to comment at least a part of this comment with regard to Agnieszka, what she has said. Marek uh, Jedynak from the uh, Kielce um, Institute of National Remembrance. A question to Mr. Friedel. It's great that someone is actually conducting this research from the transit perspective. I was actually studying the escapes of the uh, of the National Army soldiers to the West. So a question to you whether in the Czechoslovak uh, files of the security ministry, did you find any numerical data, not only with regard to Jews or more broadly about escapees, those that passed through the territories of Czechoslovakia? And again, I also have a question pertaining to the first presentation. We've been talking about the migration waves, indeed, but in your presentation, I didn't hear that post the Kielce pogrom, the wave of migration was actually the wave of uh, refugees fleeing uh, on account of being threatened by anti-Semitism. It would happen in Kielce at that time. Hence my question. Is the matter of anti-Semitism and the fact that it was actually due to the uh, anti-Semitism panic, was it mentioned at all in the documents you analyzed? Was it taken into consideration that the people were fleeing out of fear, the different things were happening at state borders, and we know that from other sources as well, and the general atmosphere, the general mood? And with regard to 1946, to what extent do you think the closing, temporary closing of the border in September 1946 had an impact on deceleration of migration. Well, the migration did happen or did reach its peak in August, uh, completely come down in uh, late autumn. So the question of the three or four weeks when the border was closed formally, uh, in spite of the illegal crossings, was it by any chance decisive or conducive to deceleration or stopping this migration wave. Any other questions? Hello, Jana Hryciuk, also from the Wrocław Institute of National Remembers. A question to uh, the last speaker. What do you think is unsatisfactory uh, approach to uh, the disloyalty, what did the authorities expect of the Roma people? In other words, once they get a job or uh, get a flat, well, they, you know, become, they would become loyal um, citizens or hardworking people. And the other question, whether the policy of local authorities changed uh, in watershed moments with regard to ethnic minorities, uh, such as in 1936, did you notice in Luban some higher interest of the security service of public administration towards the Romani minority. Sorry, a question of mine, whether someone wants to ask a question. Yes, you want to ask a question again? OK, because I would like to make a comment, yes. I have a question with regard to the first presentation. English? Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm just wondering, with the, um, the Czech, you were sort of emphasizing how the Czech authorities were very concerned to make it make clear to the Polish Jews that this was not a kind of place where they should stay. They had to, had to keep moving. This was a, a transit uh, route only. So I'm just wondering, did they really need to worry about that? I mean, weren't all the Polish Jews really trying to get elsewhere? Uh, then Czechoslovakia, was that a, actually a real concern at all? Okay. Again, a question to Yiji Friedel about Briha. 
end the transfer, the movement of Polish Jews across the Polish Czechoslovak border or Czechoslovak German border or down south to Austria. What was the what was it really like? I mean, like really like. You know, I was a mass migration, crossing of the borders. And now based on my own research, and I don't remember right now precisely how the transit through Czechoslovakia could be described, whether they were just, you know, staying at the border for some time uh, up till they were, you, you know, cleared in terms of a passport, whether they were given, allowed to uh, move on. Or well, then they were allowed to actually move from point A to B, from one border crossing to, let's say, to the Czech Austrian or Czech German border crossing. I just wanted to you to, to to give me just a few pieces of info from you know, uh, from vaccines. I mean, we know that um, the migration was accumulating migration from Poland, the Jewish community migration, plus Czechoslovakia had their own problems with the uh, uh, with displacement of Germans. And again, when I was listening to your presentation, my questions uh, were rising because you said that the Czechoslovak government didn't want the Polish Jews to, at least that's my interpretation, to actually settle in Czechoslovakia. However, again, we had this uh, German displacement process in Czechoslovakia from areas along the former uh, Czechoslovak Polish and Czechoslovak German borders, these being largely depopulated. The, the changeover of population was happening. So have you ever encountered information and documents you were studying from the central governments that maybe, maybe at least some percent of those migrant Jews from Poland could be allowed to settle, at least partially? To allow them to stand, because the you know the population potential was not big enough to make use of all these towns and lands that were that were being abandoned by the German people. And a comment to Agnieszka Klem's statement: Łukasz, uh, can I start, please? Okay, I don't really understand you, because that was a political manifest. Uh, what do you expect me of? Obviously, I stressed at the beginning that my presentation would be a detailed analysis of certain sources. Obviously, I didn't have time for that. My paper was completely different. My research on the contemporary uh, role of the Roma people in Lubany have been obviously conducted with a lot of sympathy. Uh, 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 are you claiming that, you know, they give me a bow on a daily basis and I don't have a problem actually meeting them? According to you, if we don't call a black person a Negro, they will not be black. Something is unclear here, really. I'm analyzing sources and sources are what they are. Should I actually cancel? Uh, gypsies, uh, should Marada Rodovic start singing about the Roma people? Please don't be absurd, because this is precisely what we are getting at. Let's respect people, okay, but let's not lie about the history. These are the sources, dear lady, and uh, that's uh, with regard to the police of the communist Poland should be perceived. Actually, I would say more. If a Roma p uh, person uh, considers me as something inferior, actually, if I'm a gadget, uh is she or he entitled to call me gadget? Am I worse or better? I, I don't quite fathom what you mean. I don't understand. You should assess yourselves whether I was unclear or something simply went seriously wrong here. Okay, my comment now. Barbara made reference to this ethnonym, uh, Roma versus Gypsies. One more important thing to be said. Not only in the literature on the subject, but also in the Roma community, well, not only in Poland, but uh, worldwide, there is a problem, a significant problem. There's a bis mishunk of, of, of notions, institutions, Roma institutions were promoting the ethnonym of Roma or Romani. They should be called the Roma people. 
when I was writing my articles about this ethnic minority, I used and I use the ethnonym Roma or Romani. However, there are certain circles, communities, and groups of different towns that actually prefer being called gypsies. They don't have anything against it. They have nothing against actually addressing them as gypsies. However, to make it even more complicated, in other European countries the situation is slightly similar. In Slovakia, in Czechia, some of these people, some of those communities actually even prepare, prefer to be called gypsies. However, social activists, more educated Roma people tend to prepare, uh, pr or promote the notion of Roma and Romani. So generally speaking, I should recommend the everyday use in popular science or, science or, 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 or journalism. I would suggest that the term Roma or Romani be used, plus the same group. They're Sinti. They don't call themselves either Roma or Gypsies. They are Sinti. So some in-depth knowledge is required depending on who you write about, what you write about. I would really like to that everybody is precise in the use of a notion that would more precisely correspond to the given social group or community written about or a part of the Roma slash Gypsy community. There's also some circles of, um, of researchers of Roma descent, uh, descent that I encountered when I talked it, and they actually use a double notion, Roma Gypsy. Just to give you an example, uh, the Gorzów Wielkopolski Center, Piotr uh, Krzyżanowski, for instance, a person who usually uses the term Roma and Romani. However, in his studies, you can encounter the term Gypsy. When you refer to quotations, when you cite other terms, obviously the term Gypsy appears here and there. So we really must take so many different aspects into consideration. If I may, just to supplement, all source text. I'm well. I'm not assuming that you lie about the quotations inside. Plus, in my description of the site, as the Congress dishes, not the Roma people of Luban, because they actually want to be called the Roma people. Out of discussion, obviously. However, with regard to what the Anna mentioned, I wanted to say that I haven't found in any sources any reference to the political transformations with regard to this community, this people. Uh, there was either no research with regard to uh, whether this people was considered as a whole, as an entirety, or simply these sources were not preserved. Mm, it's hard to say. I would rather say that um, the Roma people not studied from this perspective because there was no reason to do so. They were simply um, a part of local community. They had settled in the given town for some time. They had their own issues. However, the political reference is out of question, at least not in the sources that I studied. Thank you. I suggest that uh, further discussion on this particular subject could be moved to the foyer. Oh, sorry, one more matter to discuss, to address. So, dear ladies and gentlemen, let me answer the questions in an order of their asking. So the first question with regard to the the number of the former um, National Army uh, soldiers or SKPs um, that lead through uh, Czechoslovakia, I never found any information according to which one could actually establish the number of those crossing the Polish Czech or Polish Slovak border. There are just estimates. I would say we, were to we, we could be talking about several hundred people. We must bear in mind that the archives only contain information about those that were apprehended. However, we don't know anything about the, those that were not. And they could go through Czechoslovakia even several times. Actually, yesterday uh, we talked to Varek uh, Dombrovsky, who's also interested about that. We talked for several hours about this. And we 
concluded that there were examples of couriers, actually um, messengers that went in transit through Czechoslovakian territory without actually being noticed by the security services. So it's very difficult to estimate. I would say we would be talking about several hundred, like 700 maybe people, but it's just rough estimates. But, well, actually, this transit was quite, quite uh, intensive. There were certain transit points in the uh, Ostrava region, the Zaolzi region, uh, or in Prague as well. There was even a transit point secret, a covered tr transit point that enabled transit to, to the western parts, which were occupied by the American army by the end of uh, November 1945. That's as far as this question is concerned. I'm not sure whether I understood your question about anti-Semitism. Um, did you mean whether the Czechoslovak authorities were stirred by what you told them about their past and their experience. I was actually surprised a bit studying the internal materials, internal communication in Czechoslovakia, how relatively frequent it was, uh, anti-Semitism was mentioned. Sometimes we're dealing with a you know, picture of Czechoslovakia as a country that was very friendly to Jewish people a state that we might even add I was using this propaganda in reality we could come across numerous pieces of material in different offices and archives and I'm getting to your question well one could actually come across this very very negative statements such as they're dirty they don't want to let them pass let them move on Statements such as these, which is quite similar to the situation uh, described by Vishal Franco and Katarina Chapkova about the migrants, Jewish migrants from the Nazi Germany and Czechoslovakia. They were writing about it. So you could definitely come across similar opinions. Let them come, but let them go as quickly as possible as well. Now, in Czechoslovak uh, newspapers, uh, the pogrom of Kielce, if we might call it like this, that was an event to 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 uh, to sweeten up the image of um, Czechoslovakia, so to speak, by juxtaposing the anti-Semite Poland, where Jews are being, you know, persecuted and beaten, and, and on the other hand, Czechoslovakia that widely opens the door to the Jewish refugees, while in fact they were quite afraid, quite anxious about Jews staying for good in Czechoslovakia. There was also a certain specific purpose or a certain specific aim, as someone has already mentioned, because at that time we also had the displacement of uh, the German people from the, from the Sudan mountains, plus the Jews coming from concentration camps. And for the very fact that they spoke German, they were displaced as well. It was a huge affair. Uh, the consul, uh, the Czechoslovak consul in Chicago had to explain the, himself for the actions of the, of the Czechoslovak uh, authorities. And that, again, was also used um, to improve the image of Czechoslovakia. As regards this very short period of closure of the border, I don't think it had some significant importance. You have to keep in mind that this movement was both legal and illegal, so to speak. Not only were they well, individual groups passing some transit points in the borders, and they had to present certain documents who were collected by the Czechoslovak um, groups. They were patrolled and moved to transition camps. And by, by the way, I'm answering partially to your question, after several days, they were moved to to, to tank uh, to uh, trains that were secured by uh, police patrols, and they were moving them to borders with Austria or Germany, all under surveillance, obviously. But there was this illegal transit as well that we know nothing about, and again. Documents just reflect certain individual cases of someone being apprehended. If one was not 
uh, he or she would cross Czechoslovakia and we would not know that at all. And again, I believe that what would be important would probably study Israeli documents written in Hebrew because there's plenty of these materials, memoirs, reports in Hebrew, which unfortunately is, a, uh, is, is, is something that I, uh, an obstacle that I wouldn't handle because of my lack of knowledge of Hebrew. So uh, this short border closure was of no particular relevance. I believe that the biggest influx of refugees took part in July and August and at the beginning of September. And uh, after the uh, border closure, there was illegal transit, cross-border transit. So the meaning was rather political. So that we, sh so that they would satisfy either Brits or Americans. I think uh, the fear of the Czechoslovak government uh, about the settlement of the Polish Jews uh, is a very, it is a very good point. Thank you very much for it. Of course, uh, those fears were exaggerated. Um, I have not encountered any documents uh, which would prove that uh, there were some interests of, among Polish Jews. They wanted to settle in uh, Czechoslovakia. There was a plan of the Czechoslovak government uh, on a settlement of Jewish refugees on the territory of Czechoslovakia, but only in case when American authorities in occupational zones in Austria and Germany uh, would have not been able to uh, look after those uh, refugees. Uh, so um, this fear was exaggerated and sometimes it reminds me the same fear as the Czech government, current Czech government uh, has uh, as for the refugees from the Middle East or Arabian countries uh, today. I was very surprised when, I don't know, two, five years ago when I was studying in archives uh, how uh, similar views Czechoslovak government had at that time, how similar they were uh, to those views which the Czech government uh, presents, uh, presents today. So, this is it. Uh, and one more thing. And that was precisely your question. Roughly speaking, yes, uh, there was a plan if Americans uh, hadn't been able to accept further refugees to actually settle them down in Czechoslovak territory. But that was just this contingency plan. So thank you very much, especially uh, I extend my thanks to the speakers in the first place. And I thank all of you for listening to these incredibly interesting uh, presentations. We are moving to yet another point of the agenda. Edifier, thank you very much. And yes, first the launch. Uh, I thought I'd I didn't really have to say it, you know, on account of the online part of the conference. But again, you're invited for the lunch now. Thank you.